Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lapos of the House Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Tonight, we're going to be studying the nature of faith. Very important. Faith unlocks the unseen world. You don't need incantations. You don't need special revelation. You don't need mystical practices. All you need is confidence in what God says and who God is. And you will see things happen in your life. You won't, you won't be able to see the process, but you will be able to see the results. And that's the point that I made on Sunday. And that's the point that I'm going to reinforce today as we study in depth the nature of faith. So I'm going to ask Christina to open up in prayer. Christina. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for another Bible study where we can gather here together, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you just open up our hearts to receive what you have for us tonight, that we would digest it, remember it, Lord, and just pray. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading us all tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Christina. Okay, we're going to start off with a couple of teaching videos. I think this is the first one. What is faith? Here we go.
Okay, that's a cute little video, and it kind of gives a summary of where I want to go today as we talk about faith. So I hope you enjoy the Bible study. I have a lot of teaching in the beginning, and then the questions come a little later. So bear with me as we work through the scriptures together. So here we go. Now, society's definition of faith is the following. Believing something with no evidence to support it. I don't know if you have any unbelieving friends, but that's one of the challenges that they shoot at us, that we believe something and we have no evidence to believe what we believe. Another definition of faith is trusting in myths and legends as truth and not dealing in reality, that faith is a giant leap into fantasy and that faith is wishful thinking. And that Christian faith in particular is taking a Jewish peasant who lived 2,000 years ago and making him into a god for the purpose of diluting and controlling and deceiving the masses who don't know any better. I can't for the life of me understand why anybody would want to do that, but that's what the secular world believes faith is. But the word of God has a completely different perspective on what faith is, particularly faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ is not something with no evidence. It is not trusting in myths. It is not a giant leap into fantasy. It is not wishful thinking, and it is definitely not manipulating a Jewish peasant and forming him into a god for the purpose of controlling the masses. Not at all. In fact, faith in Jesus is based on an objective, verifiable historic event that can be falsified. Falsified means that there is a possibility of proving it untrue. And if it is proven untrue, then Christian faith collapses into a million pieces and is shown to be a lie. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 12, this is emphasized by the Apostle Paul, who confirms what I just said, that if you take faith in Jesus and you take away its core, the whole thing collapses. So here it comes. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. In other words, if the resurrection is not true, then the whole Christian faith crumbles. But if the resurrection is true, ah, well, that paints a very different story. In fact, if the resurrection of Jesus is a fact, then every word of the Bible is also a fact regardless of what anyone may say, because Jesus endorsed the entire scope of Scripture. So if Jesus rose from the dead, then he is who he says he is, and everything that he supported, the book of Genesis, the book of Daniel, the Psalms, the prophets, all of that is true also, because the Scriptures, he said, cannot be broken. Now, some scholars who are believing and unbelieving agree on three points, which is very important because these three points emphasize that our faith in Jesus is not faith without evidence, and it's not faith in myths. So let's take a look at the three things that all scholars, that is reliable scholars, believe, whether they are Christian or non-Christian, whether they are atheist or theist, it doesn't make any difference. They all agree on three key points. Number one, Jesus Christ actually lived and this is verified by sources outside of the scriptures, not the least of which was a man called Josephus. In other words, you can find out about Jesus outside the scriptures because he is mentioned in the works and the writings of historians of the time, the most prolific of which was a man called Josephus. Here's an artist's depiction of Josephus. Now, who was Josephus? Jo Jose Josephus. Flavius Joseph, Josephus was a first century Jewish historian who lived from 37 to 100 AD. 
That puts him right at the time that Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. He was a commander of Jewish forces in Galilee and would later become a Roman citizen. So he was very familiar with Jesus's story. He was employed as a historian by the Flavian emperor, uh, Vesp Vespian, Titus, and Domitian. Domitian in particular was extremely hostile towards Christians, and uh, he would not have appreciated the historical account of Josephus, which is mentioned in his book, Antiquities, chapter 20, verse 200. Here's what Josephus wrote about Jesus, and he was not a believer. He was a Jew working for the Romans. Here's what he wrote. At this time, there was a man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. Many people from amongst the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. And those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have recounted wonders. Amazing that this was written by an unbelieving Jew at the very time that Jesus lived. What else do scholars agree on? Well, scholars agree that Jesus was actually crucified, as Josephus said, by the Romans under Pontius Pilate. Now, a lot of people didn't believe that such a man as Pontius Pilate existed. But very recently, in the area of Caesarea, an inscription was found on an old stone that mentions Pontius Pilate as procurator of Rome. So that verifies that he did live. Scholars also concede that Jesus' tomb was found empty. There is no doubt about that in any of their mind, for the simple reason that the bones of Jesus and his burial ground, his burial ground is empty and the bones of Jesus have never been found. And if he had died and had been buried, then all they had to do was prove that he didn't rise from the dead was to produce his dead body or to produce his bones. And people have been looking for the bones of Jesus for the last 2,021 years and have not been able to find it because the bones of Jesus are not on the earth, are not buried. They're seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven. And that's where Jesus is. Finally, all scholars agree that his disciples believed to their deaths that they had seen him physically alive. Now, they don't say that Jesus rose from the dead. The believing scholars say that, but the unbelieving scholars say there's, any, there's no doubt that the disciples believed that they saw Jesus physically alive. Okay, so knowing that, skepticism would not allow these scholars to go any further. They would not go further into faith, but their conclusions raise important questions. And I've asked these questions to myself time and time again. I'm gonna ask you these questions too, starting with this one. Why would, die, why would men die or would men die for something they knew to be alive? What do you think, Sister Bev? Would men be willing to die for something they knew was a lie? I, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. In fact, this is a very interesting point. When Richard Nixon was involved in the Watergate scandal, if you don't know what that was, it was the president. Uh, he was taping private conversations and uh, he was trying to cover up a burglary at the Watergate building. And uh, he trusted 18 men with the fact that he had tried to cover it up. 18 men couldn't keep a lie for more than 18 days. And these were some of the most powerful men in the United States. And they could not hold on to a lie for more than 18 days. It spilled out. And so how did these men, 12 disciples of Galilee and 120 others and 500 witnesses, go all the way through history, all the way to their deaths, never ever doubting that Jesus rose from the dead? So that's a good question. Let's ask another question. How could a small insignificant sect bring down the Roman Empire and why could the Romans not wipe it out, Caroline? How could this little insignificant sect, Roman sect, this, this Jewish sect, not be wiped out by the mightiest empire the world has ever seen? What's your thought on that? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is, is one of the reasons is the first question that you asked is about they were willing to die. Yeah. So already when you have a population or even if it's a small group of people that are willing to die, you know, it, it creates sensation 
begs the question, then people get curious. They want to know why people are giving their lives away for what. Yeah. Um, so that's already one thing. And for them, they just had an undying gratitude for the Lord, the miracles that either they had seen, the miracles that they've experienced themselves, they couldn't deny it. And to know that they were going against, um, I mean, that they were willing to, to go to the um, Colossus, what is it called? The, the Colosseum where they had, you know, lions yeah, going against them and they were willing to go as far as that. Um, it's hard when people have a passion yeah, and when they're, they're, they're willing to go as far as possible, it's hard to stop a people like that. And then that kind of a passion, especially when it's for the right thing, spreads easily. Yep, it sure did spread. Every time the Romans persecuted Christians, the church would grow. Every time people saw Christians being butchered for their faith based on, based on the fact that they believed Jesus was alive, more people believed because they never thought that people would die for a lie. So it must be true, they, they reasoned. And eventually the Roman Empire was brought down. In fact, the Pharisee Gamaliel came up with the best reason why this faith brought down the Roman Empire. He told the Pharisees of the time who were trying to stop the disciples from preaching the resurrection of Jesus, if this is not of God, it will wear out. It will disappear. There have been other messiahs and other people making great claims that have come and have gone. But if this thing is of God, there's nothing that you can do to stop it. And you may even be fighting against God. So the reason the Romans were not able to put it down and Christianity overtook the Roman Empire is because it was a move of God. There was nothing anybody could do about it. And that's wonderful to know. All right, let's move on to the next question that raises from what the scholars have shown us. How could a group of Jews raised in rabbinical tradition declare a man to be God, which is unthinkable in Judaism and still is? How could these Jews who believed that God was one and that no man could ever be God come up with a faith like the Christian faith, Oliver? Because beyond a shadow of, the, of a doubt, they knew he was Lord and God and that he fulfilled all the requirements that were prophesied of him in the Old Testament. Okay, that's a good answer. Because they knew that he had fulfilled all the requirements and they knew he was God. They were witnesses that he was indeed God in the flesh. And that's how. But it's still a miracle. And it still makes you think how Jewish men raised in rabbinical tradition would declare a man to be God. You'd have to think twice that, hey, maybe this is true. This is not a myth. This is not a legend. So the Christian faith, based on the things that we've just asked, does not fall in the category of believing something without evidence. The evidence is there. But in my experience, the evidence is rarely examined by unbelievers. They never take the time to really look at the evidence. And another thing I've learned is that no matter how much evidence you give to a skeptic, it's never enough. But for our purposes, we need to know what faith really is. What is faith? And so a great description can be found in Hebrews 11, verses 1 to 6. So here we go. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. In other words, the universe didn't create itself. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. Abel offered an animal sacrifice to God, which is what God required. Cain offered vegetables, Cain's offering was rejected because it was not what God required. Abel's sacrifice was accepted. That was an act of faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch was a righteous man in the midst of a completely corrupt world. And God had such favor on him that he took him into heaven bodily without him even having to die. Now, I don't know where Enoch is now or what happened to him, but I'm sure we'll find out. Verse 6, for without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, the definition of faith are these underlying portions of the scripture. 
So we'll come back to them in a minute. Here's another section that talks about faith. What then shall we say what was gained? Uh, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Here's the definition of faith. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Here's an artist's depiction of Abraham down here. Now, what did he believe? Well, Abraham was a pagan, and he lived amongst idols. And in that society, idol worship was very big. Well, one day the Lord spoke to him and said, I will make you the father of many nations. And if you look out to the stars of the sky, as you see here in this artist's depiction, your descendants will be greater in number than the stars of the sky. And Abraham believed God. He had no doubt that God was telling him the truth. And as a result, he, lifted, he left his father's house into a land that God had prepared for him, which was an act of faith. So how do you describe faith? based on these two passages, this one and that one. I'll leave them up so that you can see. Okay, Christina, how do you describe faith based on those passages? Just one thing. You oh, said I, you were going to keep the passages. I forgot to, I forgot to leave it up here. Okay, there you go. So what is faith? It's framed by the word of God. It's framed by the word of God. What, what, what is framed by the word of God? It's things unseen and believing as if it were. Okay, so it's believing the things are unseen are just as real as the things that are seen. Okay, that's one definition. Very good. Kofi, what is faith based on the passages that we've just seen? What is faith, Kofi? I'll say faith is hearing instructions from god faith is and receiving yeah go ahead receiving this yeah receiving instructions from god yeah because and obeying him yeah uh, unwaveringly and that's what and that's what abel did abel offered a, a sacrifice that god had required back in that time which was an animal sacrifice would shed blood for the forgiveness of sin and cain did not obey god at all he offered vegetables so yes it's obeying god and trusting him and obeying him in every detail. Now, John Cardos, what is faith based on what you see now here? What's in front of you? No, oh, there he is. Okay. What is faith, John? Just take it right from the scriptures. If you're talking, I can't hear you. Your microphone's probably not on. I'm sorry. <laughs> what is faith? You have uh, one has to diligently, as in Hebrews, it says that one has to diligently seek him. He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. It doesn't mean he gives you rewards, all kinds of rewards. He, he rewards you with himself. Okay. In other words, if you're diligently seeking him, his reward is himself. Our exceeding great reward is Christ in us. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Tom, when I diligently seek God, what do I have to believe? Uh, that he is. That he is God. That he is. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah that he's there. The savior. savior. That he is. Yeah, okay. And that he rewards those who diligently seek him because he's real. He's not fake. Yeah. Okay, let's see now. What about this one? Valerie, what is faith right here? I just marked it for you. Sorry, I had to put sound. Abraham believed God it was counted to him as righteousness. Just believing so, God, yeah. That's faith. Just believing. believe. That's all it is. Yeah, so simple, eh? All right, so here, let's take a look at the, a summary of what we've just seen. Faith is believing God, taking him at his word. We just saw that. Faith is pleasing God because you realize he is real and we are subject to him. Faith delights 
in God more than anything else in the world. It is believing that he's real and that he sees and hears and responds to those who trust him. That's basically what you all said. So I'll just review that one more time. Faith is believing God, taking him at his word. Faith is pleasing God because you realize he's real and we are subject to him. He is over us. Faith delights in God more than anything else in the world. It is believing that he is real, like Tom said, and that he sees and hears and responds to those who trust him, like John said. Here are more verses on faith. Let's see what you have to say about this. Those who know your name trust in you, for Lord, you have never forsaken those who seek you. Psalm 9.10. What does that tell us? That faith is trust and confidence in God more than anything or anyone and expecting a response. There's no point in praying to God and not expecting a response. This verse tells us that he has never forsaken those who seek him. He's never forsaken those who seek him. So that means that he will respond if you cry out to him. Isn't that wonderful? He's faithful. Have faith in God. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. What does that tell us? Faith is knowing God has your back, and that his word is a sure, true foundation for living. His word, the law, the prophets, the Psalms, the wisdom, literature, uh, the history of the Old Testament, the New Testament, the epistles, everything, the gospels, the whole scope of scripture is reliable. Okay, what else? Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I want to give that one to somebody. Let's see. Uh, Justin, what, do you, what does that say to you? Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What do you get from that? Justin. Well, it's, um, it's basically just trusting him with uh, the instructions that he's given that he's given you. So in that book, like in Joshua, like, you know, he's given him instructions to go into the land. Yeah. And um, as he, as he went into the land, um, you know, the uh, he had faith into and, and complete trust into that God was going to be with him. So he, he was strengthened uh, but, by, uh, by his faith in God. Yeah, that's right. Because Joshua, this is a quote from Joshua what God said to Joshua, Joshua was about to go into the promised land and he had to defeat the nations that had occupied the land in order for Israel to live there. And all these people were stronger in number, in some cases, stronger armies than Israel. So God told him not to be afraid because the Lord, your God will be with you wherever you go. So faith is knowing that God is with you always, even to the end of the age. Be still and know that I am God. Christina, what do you what does that say to you? Be still and know that I am God. What does that say to me? Yep. It means stop worrying, shut up, sit back, trust stop. him, and wait for him to move because he's God, he's big, and he's got solution. That's what okay. that means to me. <laughs> oh, very good. So let's put it in this way: faith is at peace, faith does not worry. It is not overcome with anxiety, but rests in the assurance that God has everything under control. That's what be still and know that I am God talks about. Psalm 46.10. But I trust in your unfailing love, and my heart rejoices in your salvation. Psalm 13.5. And that tells us that faith is being glad that God has revealed himself to you. I hope you're all glad that you know the Lord intimately. He is in your life, and that's something to rejoice about. And this one? Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Kofi, what does that say to you? Psalm 20, verse 7. Well, it explains where our faith is. That our faith is in God. Um, yeah. It's not in human strength or human wisdom or strategy. Okay. Faith does not trust in the power of men but in the power of God. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. Faith and fear cannot coexist. Faith and fear cannot coexist in the same body. You either have faith or you have fear, but not both. Let my faith overcome my fear, the song said at the beginning of the Bible study. And this one is for Caroline. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight, or as the King James says, 
he will direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, Caroline, what does that say to you? It's my favorite verse, and I shared it with Natalie last week, actually. <laughs> yeah, I know, that, I know, that's why I gave it to you. This uh, basically says to me not to worry about the future, that God has it all under control, yes. and that as long as we give our lives to him, we give our thoughts to him, as, as long as we trust in him, for me, submitting uh, um, in all our ways, submit to him, for me, means just giving him my plans. When I wake up in the morning, I... I give my plans to him and I know that he's going to guide me along the way. Very good. Thank you very much. Let's see what I put. I interpreted this. The Lord will give you wisdom and insight beyond your natural abilities. That's what that verse says to me. The most important object of faith is how someone is saved from the power of sin, how someone is accepted by God, how someone is declared innocent of all infractions and sins, past, present, and future and how someone is guaranteed a place in the eternal kingdom of God. It's great to have faith, but this is a specific type of faith. It's called saving faith, the faith that gets you into heaven. Let's find out what this faith is in Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 21. Now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. The prophets told us about Jesus. They told us that he would be born of a woman. They told us he would be born in Bethlehem. They told us he would be praised by little children. They told us he would be crucified with criminals. They told us that he would be declared the son of God. And uh, that's one, two, three, four, five prophecies. And there are 295 more prophecies that the prophets made about the Lord yeah. Jesus. Uh, I beg your pardon? Yeah, 200, 295 more. Okay, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed as to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. Okay, so based on this passage, let me just dump this picture for a second. There we go. Based on that passage, what is saving faith? Tom, let's start with you. What do you see here? Can you hear me? Yep. What is saving faith? Is... Yeah, what is saving? It's all described right there in that passage. The faith that gets you into heaven. It's believing in Jesus and what he's done for us. Okay, well, show me specific. We're, ju we're justified by him. We're justified by him. Okay, where, do you, where is that? That is... Uh, justified now... freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, there's rede how do we get redemption in Christ? Whom God set forth. God sent God. him forth, and he died on the cross, and forgiveness of sin comes from what? From his blood through faith. Yeah. To demonstrate his righteousness. Okay, so that means that saving faith is believing in what Jesus did on the cross, trusting in his blood to forgive you of, his sin, of your sins, and uh, not trusting in works and the law. Yes. As it says here, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Okay, so let's summarize these truths that we see in this passage. Number one, God has continually revealed his plan to free us of our sins, even in the Old Testament. How do I know that? Because it's being witnessed. The law and the prophets, they spoke about Jesus. So that's how I know that God has been speaking about what Jesus would do even before Jesus got here. The righteousness, that righteousness, holiness, and innocence comes not by being good, by, but by faith in Jesus. So how do I become righteous? How do I become accepted before God? Through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's to all and on all who believe. Anyone who believes in what Jesus did and accepts it into their lives is saved. Next, all men and women are sinners before God. And the only way that they can be forgiven is that Jesus paid for their sins through the shedding of his blood on the cross. So faith and confidence in what Jesus did saves you. 
not just believing it. That's not enough. A lot of people believe Jesus died for the sins of the world, but they're not saved because they don't have confidence in that. They're not resting in that. They haven't brought it into their lives. They haven't applied it to themselves. They haven't prayed to Jesus, Lord, forgive me. I trust in what you did. I have no chance of being saved myself. So it's faith and confidence in what Jesus did to save us. And finally, any mercy shown by God previous to Jesus coming and dying for the sins of the world was looking forward to that great event. That's why he was able to forgive people like the woman caught in adultery. And he was able to forgive the crippled man when he said to him, your sins are forgiven, pick up your bed and walk because he was looking forward to what he would do on the cross. Okay, there's more. Romans chapter four has some very, very powerful scriptures about what saving faith is. Now to the one who works, his wages is not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Romans 4, 16. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all of his offering, offspring or children, not only to the adherent of the law, not only to the Jew, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, that's you and me, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of, the, of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which are not as if they were in hope, believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, as has been told, so your shall your uh, as it has been told, so shall your offspring be. So, what do we learn from this passage? We learn something about faith, the faith of Abraham. Now, we already have established that the faith of Abraham was very simple. There's nothing complicated about it. Abraham believed God, and to him it was counted as righteousness. And anyone who believes in Jesus and what he did on the cross and receives that into their life, demonstrates the faith of Abraham because they take God at his word. God says that you cannot be saved through works. Because if you believe that you're saved by works, it means you're working for your salvation and God owes you salvation. But no, it doesn't go to him who works, but it goes to him who believes. Now, it's God that said that. I didn't make that up. This is God's law. This is God's truth. And if I believe God's truth and I live by it, I am saved. So that's what we learn from this passage. The act of God acknowledging faith in Jesus is sufficient for his pardon and approval, and it's an act of grace. So tell me, how is faith in Jesus and receiving salvation through faith alone an act of grace? Gerhard, you want to try that one? Tough question. Was Gerhard there? Sorry, it's misbehaving. That's all right. I can hear you now. Um, How is believing in Jesus and having faith, and I get saved through that, just that is an act of grace. How is that? Because God didn't have to pay, the, Jesus didn't have to pay the penalty for that. Didn't, what do you mean he didn't have to pay the penalty? Well, he didn't have to do that for us. Like he didn't. Oh, have I see to... what you mean. You're right. He didn't have to die for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's but... like, that's an act of grace. Yeah, that's right. It is. He it, didn't making have... it that easy is just an act of grace. There's that no. Is, uh... it, it is. It is very easy. So why is it if it's so easy to make it into heaven? Why do so many people reject it? John Cardos, what do you think? Why do so many people reject the gospel if it's so easy to be right with God? Well, because, because even the grace to believe comes from God. Uh-huh. says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah. Because you are in Christ, which means you're in belief in Christ, uh, that, that means that, 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 that you have grace. grace. You know, we think that goodness, uh, goodness is, you know, uh, obeying the law, doing good works, and all of those things. No, it's, it's, it's an act of the heart. I see. Belief comes from the, the heart. Okay. The heart believes, and it's an, act of, it's an act of righteousness. I see why it's an act of righteousness. Yeah. To believe, to believe something. Okay. Believe God. Anybody, uh, Kofi, you want to add to that? How is faith 
being saved by faith alone an act of grace, Kofi? Um, well, grace is is a, a, a divine activity. It is it's it comes only by um, God. Yeah. Um, and it is born out of His love um, right. for us. So being you know the act of salvation itself um, is born out of God's love um, for us. Uh, okay. and, and so that's what, you know, the, it, because he loves us so much, he extends his grace to us. Yes. Um, and by us accepting that grace that is given to us, we are saved. Okay. Accepting the grace that is given to us. That's, that's good. Okay. Very good. Let's move on. Grace is getting what you don't deserve and not uh, getting what you do deserve. What do we deserve? Uh, Judgment. <laughs> condemnation banishment to eternal hell what don't we deserve being accepted by god being forgiven of our sins and giving entry being given entry into the kingdom of god and that comes by faith and faith comes by the grace of god it is by grace we are saved through faith and it is not of ourselves but it is a gift of god isn't that wonderful here's a passage that describes it all ephesians 2 4 to 8 but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, Kofi mentioned that, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, has made, or in sins, has made us alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. That is an act of God, not our act. And raised us up together and made us all sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us, in Christ Jesus, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, that kind of summarizes everything, doesn't it? So we had no chance of being saved by good works, only by God's grace. Would anybody like to tell me why we cannot be saved by good works? Anybody because, want to tell me? Well, because... Uh, because we we can't do good works on our own we can't do good works we don't even know what a good work is <laughs> not really if you listen to cnn and what, what people think are good is good that's nonsense the only god god is good jesus said it only god is good he said it to somebody only god is good uh, uh, so anyway <laughs> all right okay that's acceptable what about you sister uh, Bev? why can't good works save us Oh, microphone. Well, it won't last too long. It good works today <laughs> and nothing tomorrow. Well, you're right about that. We may do good works here and there, but we're not consistent. That's for sure. Okay, what about you, Christina? How come good works can't save us? Because it depends on us. Ah, depends on us. Okay. And there, then we don't have what it takes to no, God's and, and then that means we get the glory and not God for Ooh. what he's done for us. Yeah, you know, I just got a thought that trying to make it into heaven by good works is saying I'm better than Jesus. Eee, that's pretty scary stuff. Brother Jeffrey, why do good works, uh, why are good works not sufficient to get us into the kingdom of God? Um, it's we cannot pay for the debts that Christ paid. So we don't have enough money in the bank to pay the price of our salvation, basically. We don't have enough money in the bank. <laughs> I like that. Okay, I think I understand what you mean. But it is a matter of the heart, like John said. And in, uh, trusting in God and believing God is an act of the heart. It is not a work. It is not a work at all. Faith is not a work. Grace is received by God to have faith. And faith unlocks salvation and makes it real for us because what Jesus did on the cross is applied to our lives. I don't know how it's done. I have no idea. I, I've never seen it done. I just see the results of what happens to somebody when they put their trust in Jesus. It's a wonderful thing. All right, let's move on in the Bible study then. Finally, we look at Romans 4.24. It will be counted to us who believed in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. 
12. In other words, it takes faith in what Jesus did on the cross and it applies to each one of us and it is entirely spiritual and yet very real. In other words, you can't see what it's like for the blood of Jesus to be applied to you. When I got say, when I asked Jesus to come into my heart, the blood was applied to me. I was washed from my sins by the blood of Christ, but I didn't see red. I didn't see blood. I, in fact, I didn't see anything. I just prayed a prayer and all of a sudden I was different. So a spiritual result happened as a result of faith. It's entirely spiritual and yet very, very real. Now, because of that, we can conclude that the same goes for anything in the kingdom of God. Faith unlocks the unseen. Remember that. That's the point I wanted to make on Sunday, that it is faith that unlocks the unseen. It is faith that moves the hand of God. And not faith as a force, not to, to grit your teeth and force yourself to believe something, but just trust and confidence in what God says. So that's all you need is faith, and you will see miracles. So the same goes for healing, miracles, and any act that is supernaturally manifested. It requires only faith. Faith opens the door to the unseen realities of God. No need for rituals, ceremonies, incantations, special knowledge, higher levels, mystical practices. None of that is needed. All you need is faith, trust in God that comes from an act of grace on his behalf and love for him. However, your faith can be increased. So even though we're not talking about higher levels and mystical practices and special knowledge, which is all bogus, by the way, rituals and ceremonies and special prophecies, it's all garbage. You can increase your faith. You can grow in faith. Can somebody tell me how you can grow in faith? Anyone? By, by using it. Okay, by using it. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else? How can we grow in faith? By reading and obeying the word of God. By reading and obeying the word of God. One. Something else? How can we grow in faith? Prayer. Prayer? How does prayer help me to grow in faith? Whoops, sorry. How does prayer help? Well, let me tell you. No. You uh, connect with the Lord. He like builds up your faith even when you're like sitting there still in his presence. Like there's a supernatural exchange even when you speak with him and let him speak back to you. It builds you up for like the day. There you go. Prayer builds you up because you're in the presence of God. What about uh, what else can we uh, use to build our faith? How else can we build our faith, Caroline? Oh, hearing the word of God. Oh, I think Oliver already said that. Faith work oh. is through, through love. Yes, I know. How else can we increase our faith? The word of God, prayer, what else? Can it also be Fellowship, through... Fellowship, worship. Oh, what? Hold it. Natalie, yes? Sorry. No, Natalie, go ahead. I was going to say, it could also be maybe like through fellowship by surrounding ourselves with people that have the same beliefs as us. Yeah, and very good. Them. Fellowship. Yeah, that increases faith because sometimes we feel down and we need the encouragement of our brothers and sisters. And sometimes they have more faith than we do. And their yeah. faith rubs off on us. Very good, Natalie. You get a bunny sticker. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll show you what a bunny sticker is eventually. And Caroline, how else can we build up our faith? You see where I'm going with this, eh, Justin? The five pillars of the oh, Christian faith. Oh, very good. Yes. <laughs> Two more left. Two more left. Caroline, how can I build up my faith? We've had prayer. We've had fellowship. We've had the word of God. Two more. Service. Oh, service. How does service build up my faith? I know service is something we're supposed to do. How it how it builds up my faith. I'm trying to think of a scripture Ooh, okay. that would support that basis but i just know service is something we are supposed to do as christians you're right can i give you a scripture verse sure you know when people were casting out demons in jesus name they were going around casting uh, demons in yeah. jesus name and the apostles got upset and jesus said no one who casts out demons in my name could ever feel badly about me they would only have faith right so as you serve and you see god move you're gonna have more faith that's that's how yeah. That's how service builds your faith. The last one, one more. How do we build up our faith? We have service, the word, prayer, fellowship, and worship. Ah, worship. How does worship build up my faith? His presence. 
his presence yeah well, what well his else? presence his presence fills you fills you in and also the time that you spend uh, with him so um waking up in the morning is usually a routine that i do and one of the first things that i do is spending time in uh in prayer so yeah. uh, especially by uh taking time to hear on what he what he says and the instructions the obedience um your faith increases Okay, now I want to add one thing before we close the Bible study, and I'm going to give this one to Kofi. Kofi, I want you to listen to what I have to say, and you tell me what do I mean. Here we go. I do not practice the five pillars of the Christian life to get faith. I practice the five pillars of the Christian life because I have faith, and when I practice them, my faith increases. Can you explain what I just said? I always give them the easy stuff. So, so the the five pillars um, are not disciplines. Um, if, okay. if you didn't have the spirit of God living inside of you, uh, if you you weren't a child of God, um, you could you could still do those things, uh, but they'll have absolutely no effect zero um, on on faith. So. Yeah. Um, in, in order to even begin to, to do those things uh, in relation to um, your, your relationship with God, you have to have a relationship with God. Oh, okay. Well, wow, that's very good. Um, and so once you have a relationship with God, then um, reading the Bible becomes meaningful because uh, the word of God is being revealed to you whilst you're reading the text. Um, praying becomes meaningful because you're actually having a conversation with God instead of reciting incantations. Um, you know, worship uh, uh, you know comes from the heart and it's in truth. Uh, um, as Jesus said, you know, uh, God is seeking those who worship Him in spirit uh, and in truth. So it's not just you know singing a bunch of hymns from a book. Um, it's you know singing even if you're singing from a book, you're singing with meaning. Um, out of the love and relationship and intimacy that you have with him uh, and you serve others and 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 relate to others and, and fellowship with others um, to share the love that God has poured in your heart so each of these activities um, are not you know uh, dry uh, rituals uh, they, they actually stem from a heart uh, and a spirit that um, um, has has been um, birthed out of faith uh, and the grace of God and as you do these things um, you know they, they are more meaningful uh, and they actually help to build your relationship um, with, with the Lord so you know faith is not apart from God faith is not a little um, you know token that God gives you that is apart from himself faith is what actually allows you to have a relationship um, with God. So as you get closer to God, uh, um, you know, your faith is built. And these things are just a part of the, the relationship that you have with God. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much for that answer. And that pretty well wraps it up. Well, the last point I wanted to make was, and it's a very important point. Faith is a very simple thing, but it can only be given to us by God. Faith comes from God. To each man, the Lord says, is given a measure of faith. But if I have faith and I love the Lord, I will pursue him in the means that he's given me. The word of God, prayer, fellowship, worship, and service. I will do those things, not because I want to get more faith, but because I already have faith and I already love the Lord. And I know that this is the way I connect with him. And as I connect with him and get to know him better, of course, my faith is going to increase because I'm going to see some marvelous things. And that is the key to the unseen world. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. I'm going to ask Mark to close in prayer. Mark. Father, thank you for this uh, time together. Thank you for the study, which reminds us, Lord, that you have given us the faith that is required to serve you. By grace, we have been saved through faith. And, Lord, that you have predestined us from the found from the foundations of the world lord um, you have elected us to be uh to be your chosen to be called sons and daughters of god 
Father, I just pray for each one here, Lord, that they would grow in their faith. Lord, that each one would be able to practice their faith and exercise the gift of faith in their lives. I pray that you might bestow it upon each one. Father, thank you for this time of learning. Thank you for this time of discussion. And I pray, Lord, that as we pray for each other, we would grow in our faith. We would give you thanks. We would give you glory. We would give you honor as is fulfilled in the purpose that you've called us, each one of us. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his life. Thank you for his death. And thank you that he lives within us. Oh, God, it enables us every day to serve you. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to show one more little film before we go. And at the end of the film, I'm going to end the Bible study without saying goodbye. But thanks all for listening. And I hope that you'll get a lot from what I'm about to play right now. This is on faith. Here we go. Please stay with us. This teaching is on faith, and the purpose of this teaching is how to increase faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Also, without faith, it's impossible to do the works that Jesus Christ said that we can do. In fact, Jesus has given us instructions to go and to lay hands on the sick and to heal them. To do the things that he has asked us to do is going to require faith. So it's very important that we have a proper understanding of faith. Because I think that one of the fundamental things which has almost in some ways dissolved or eroded a Christian's power base is an improper understanding of what faith is. In fact, you know, just think about this for a minute. If you think that faith is something other than what it is, then we're not really going to please God. And we're not going to do those works that Jesus is asking us, the things that he has called us to do. In the Christian church, there's been kind of a general attitude that faith is this metaphysical type force of the mind. That if I can just channel my thoughts and hold my thoughts in a positive mind frame, that then something magical is going to happen. Faith is not magical. Faith is nothing more than trusting. That's all the word uh, in the biblical text. That's all that the Greek word pistis means when it should be properly translated. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. And in Hebrews 11:1 1, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for. See, faith is being sure. Faith is being confident. Faith is having trust. Faith is having assurance. In fact, my good friend John Sheenheit has recently taught a teaching on assurance. What is faith? And I would recommend that you go to that YouTube teaching. But see, in my background, I was raised in the Roman Catholic faith. And a lot of times it just got kind of, kind of this magical thinking about faith, that faith is to believe in something that there's no proof of. God never asks us to believe in something for which there's no proof. That's, that's really kind of silly. When we trust in things, we trust because there is proof. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says that we increase our faith by hearing and hearing the word of God. Well, how does that increase our faith? It increases our faith because when I read the word of God, I can see the promises of God. I can see the mighty works of God. I can read about the works that Jesus Christ did and it builds my confidence. It builds my trust. In fact, if God is able to do that for Saul or, or Paul or Peter or James or John or other first century Christians, he'll certainly do it for me. Someone wrote me the other day and said, am I a bad Christian because I don't read my Bible? I, I answered and I said, no, I'm not going to say that you're a bad Christian, but I'll tell you this, you're going to be ignorant. Is that what we want, to be ignorant Christians? to be able to be batted around because we don't know what God has promised? If we're going to increase our faith, then we need to understand that faith is not a metaphysical, magical thing that we do in our mind. It's trusting in God. It's trusting in the promises of God. In fact, in the uh, Greek lexicon by Lydell and Scott, 
which John I know has mentioned in his teaching, is sold through Christian or through bookstores, through college students, so that they can study Greek. And the definition is pistis, the Greek word that we translate into faith means nothing more than to trust in others. It also, in the Vines lexicon, it means to have a firm persuasion, to be firmly persuaded. That's all faith is. I am absolutely confident that what God says I can do, I can do. I'm firmly persuaded. That is walking in faith. You know, I have faith in this chair that I'm sitting in right now. It's a very tangible thing. I don't know if you can see it, but this chair is holding me up. There's an implied promise by this chair that it is solid and it'll hold me up. So I can have faith in it. I can trust that this chair will hold me up. And the more I sit in this chair, I don't ever come in here and sit down behind my desk and say, gee, I hope today that the chair will hold me up. No, because I, by consistently sitting in the chair, there's, a, there's an implied promise that it will hold me up. I can have faith, confidence in this chair. I can also have confidence or faith in this pen because every time I've opened this pen and I have written with it, ink has come out. I have been able to write words. I have faith, trust in this pen. In the same way, we can have the exact same trust in God and in Jesus Christ and in the promises of God because we can trust them. That's all faith is. I have faith in my friends because they prove themselves trustworthy. When they say they're going to do something, they do something. Yet if a person tells me, hey, meet me um, out front of your house, Dan, at 9 o'clock, and let's go to the uh, movies, and if I know that consistently they don't do what they say they're going to do, I have very little faith or trust in that person. That's all faith is, is trusting in in, in an object or in a promise. And God's word is filled with promises. God's word is yea, and there's no nay in it. Let's uh, look at John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, and in verse 10, it says, So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, Lazarus, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. When I read the word faith, I just automatically change it a lot of times to trust. They put their trust in Jesus. Why? Because they saw a tangible person, Lazarus, raised from the dead, so therefore they trusted in Jesus. You know, again, this idea of faith is that it's, it's believing in something for which there's no proof. It's a metaphysical mind control, and that erodes your ability to really trust in God. Because then I think I've got to think perfectly. No, I know, by God, my God can do it. If Jesus Christ told me to lay hands and to pray healing for someone, when I walk in that trust and confidence that, that if I pray they will be healed, then that opens the door for God's power to be activated and them to be healed. Now, in those instances, it's also the faith of the individual who's being prayed for. It's the trust or confidence or faith of the person who's ministering. There's also a community faith that can be involved or community trust in the promises of God. There's lots of factors concerning healing. But what I want to get the message across to you loud and clear is that faith is nothing more than trusting in the promises of God, trusting in God. When God tells us to have faith, it means to trust. When he says it's impossible to please him without faith, it's impossible to please God if we don't trust in him. I'll read a, just a couple other quick examples here. In John chapter 14, since we're already in John, let's look at verse 12. It says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me, trust in me, will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things because I am going to the Father. It's nothing more than trust in Him. And the woman in Mark chapter 5, verse 33 and 34, who came to Him, who fought through the crowd, who touched the hem of His garment and was healed, why was she healed? She was healed because of the power of God, but she trusted the promise of God that said that there would be healing in the Messiah's wings, in the Savior's wings. 
the wings of his garment. Those were the corners, the tassels of his robe. And she reached out with confidence that God's word said that she would be healed. When she touched it, she trusted in a tangible promise. And at that moment, she was healed. And Jesus said, woman, your faith, your trust has made you whole, has healed you. So as we go forward, I want you to change your thinking. No longer is faith about something that is that there is no evidence of. It is nothing metaphysical. It is trust, and it's trusting that what God said you can do, you can do. And that's about it. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.